muito interessante, uma boa vontade muito grande, que o pessoal trabalhou muito essa semana inteira. Então, o professor Daniel Gustavo, da Universidade da Califórnia, em Los Angeles, vai nos falar as coisas, uma marmota de ventre a trelo, e sai de uma visão emergente da socialidade. Ok, once again, thank you for everything. Um, I'm actually really excited to get some feedback and discussion about some of these ideas because I'm not an epistemologist, um, but I use the term immersion. So I'll probably be yelled at after this, but that's okay, I want to learn. Um, thank you again for listening to me. Um, I want to share what I spend an inordinate amount of my life doing um, with you guys today, and that's uh, looking at and listening to marmots. Um, and thinking about social behavior. So, social behavior, louder? Okay, I'll try to hold it up a little higher, there we go. Social behavior is one of those fundamental questions um, of life. Why are animals social? Why do animals um, do things that might be costly? How does altruism evolve? But when we use the word sociality, we really mean many different things. At one level, when we say sociality, we think about social organization, the size, the composition, the cohesion, and the genetic structure of a social unit. Also, we might be referring to variation in the mating system. Who mates with whom? Uh, people talk about sociality and they're talking about mating systems and mating system differences. We also might um, think about the social structure which we might we can define as the sum of all possible social relationships. I want to talk about some of these things in the context of yellow-bellied marmots. So the yellow-bellied marmots studied in the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory is one of the longest running studies of non-game mammals in the world. Ken Armitage, pictured here, started the study in 1962 and ran the project until 2001. And during this time, uh, he developed a really important demographic data set that um, Ken and I and others use to understand um, how animals may or may not respond to climate change, um, drivers of population, uh, biology, etc. I spent a lot of time studying different species of marmots before I settled in to studying the yellow-bellied marmots. There are uh, 14 or 15 species of marmots around the northern hemisphere. Marmots are a type of ground squirrel. And we know a lot about uh, social behavior and communication in mammals by studies of ground squirrels and marmots and prairie dogs. We know this because they have an address. We know where they live. They live in holes in the ground. And they're diurnal, so you can sit and watch them. Many of them are relatively easy to mark, so you can sit and watch the soap opera um, while you're understanding their behavior. Uh, we also have a holiday in North America, Groundhog Day. It's a uh, midwinter festival. Uh, it comes from initially a pagan holiday and then the Christian holiday of Candlemas Day. And marmots are reputed to uh, predict the weather. So, you know, marmots, so if you study animal behavior, uh, groundhogs are one of the 14 species of marmots. If you study animal behavior, here's a holiday about animal behavior and it involves marmots. So that's a good reason to study marmots. <laughs> So we study marmots at the, uh, these days at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. It's a beautiful subalpine field station located near Crested Butte in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And marmots live, uh, we study them about along about a five kilometer stretch of the valley floor in this area. So marmots are hibernating mammals. Um, they survive the winter by uh, storing fat. Um, people study the physiology of marmots because they can become obese without becoming unhealthy. They don't get diabetes. So there's a lot of nasty physiological studies of marmots trying to understand how one can double one's weight without suffering ill consequences. In any event, marmots emerge from hibernation in April and May. Um, if there's still snow on the ground, they might be killed by predators or they might be losing mass systematically. And we say that when 50% of the group has been seen, we say the group's up. We don't see every individual every day in the, in the spring or, or, or any day during the year, particularly for bigger groups. And then when the, we say that the growing season has started when 50% of the snow is melted. Normally, in, in normal years, they're, they're digging through one to two meters of snow when they emerge. 
males emerge before females. Um, males then sometimes wake up females. We've seen females uh, be given uh, flowers, dry plants. Um, it's kind of cute, you know, two meters of snow around and some males coming around with dry plants and digging out a female to mate with. Um, and, and then uh, reproduction happens. They have about a 30 day gestation period and about 25 days of lactation. And uh, the um, yearlings disperse pretty much um, before the babies of that year emerge. Um, almost all the males disperse and about half of the females. Pups emerge in late June, um, early July, and uh, everyone tries to get fat. Um, Marmots, adults, uh, males may be about five to six kilos at the end of the season. Females may be four to five kilos at the end of the season. And um, pups, if they're going to survive, have to be well over a kilo. They emerge above ground about 350 to about um, 500 grams. But typically they're, they're, they're heavier, they're closer to one and a half kilos. And then they hibernate in September and October. Um, the other good thing about studying marmots is they follow the Northern Hemisphere's academic calendar. So, um, you know, more or less, they're active during the summer and they hibernate during the winter. Now we've done hibernation studies of them where we've borrowed animals from the field and brought them back to the lab to study the physiology, but I'm not going to be talking about those studies today. They're herbivores, they live in um, small to sometimes large home ranges. So what you can see here is you can see uh, a meadow where the marmot have burrows, um, and there's a black line going through this meadow. I, I call that the line of death. Marmots on one side of this meadow never cross over into the other side and vice versa. So even though they're living in areas, um, there can be distinct social groups in what we might call a colony site. Ken started forming a genealogy um, by observations um, over the years, and he reported that these species, um, that, that, that females may recruit their daughters to form matrilines, and that from a female perspective, um, they have a matrilineal association, as do some primates. And male marmots you could describe as being parapolygenous, and that one male would try to defend more than one or more females um, and you know, have more than one wife, essentially. However, um, if you look at long-term statistics, at least long-term before the last decade, um, the most common group size was a single male and a single female. So what I see when I look at this population is I see tremendous social plasticity. And that social plasticity offers a really good chance to begin to study interesting questions about the costs and benefits of sociality and about the ecological conditions that might um, favor one thing or another. In the past decade, many of the groups um, have had more than a single male, and I'll come back to that natural experiment in a while. Now, um, Ken's um, studies have demonstrated that kinship influences female agonistic and affiliative behavior. Males behave aggressively towards other males, regardless of relationship. Mothers um, recruit daughters to form their matrilines, and females that are, have um, relatively high coefficients of relationship behave um, amicably towards each other, nicely towards each other, while those with relatively low coefficients of relationship behave uh, more aggressively towards each other. So kinship matters in terms of how individuals behave. Turns out that there's the opportunity for reproductive suppression, so sociality isn't all it's shaken up to be. There are fundamental costs of being social, and one of those is that um, female marmots, um, young ones, two years old and three year old marmots, who should be able to breed, who are physiologically capable of reproduction, are less likely to reproduce if they're surrounded by other older individuals. And what you see um, at a population level is you see reduced probability of breeding the first two years of life. So there are you know, a number of ecological drivers of social variation. We can ask questions about food limitation and predation risk and infanticide risk. Um, which comes from asking these questions, comes from uh, interest in primatologists and the ecological models of sociality. And we can see uh, parallels that might explain uh, differences um, in, in the marmots as well. So higher alpine populations uh, may be more food limited, and then we find that larger habitat patches, these grassy areas um, in, the, in the valley floor or along the side of the valley, 
typically have more adult females. So there are ecological constraints on how many females can live in a certain area. It doesn't mean that every year you're going to have a lot of females, but it does mean that ecology provides an initial filter through which more than a single female can live. We find um, huge effects of predation on population persistence. I talked about this yesterday. Um, if you look at what I'll call fear-related characteristics versus food-related characteristics, we did a large cross-sectional study of many, many places where marmots have been seen and lived, um, and also areas where um, marmots weren't. And we chose areas where marmots weren't by looking at um, a map and developing a model where we said, okay, well, you know, they could be here, so it has to be an open area, but um, they're not. And what we found is that um, either looking at models that we've developed, logistic models, um, we developed to look at the probability of um, extinction, if you will, over time, or the presence or absence of marmots. Both of them um, were influenced, in this case, I'm looking at population persistence over about uh, 47 years. Um, both of these models were influenced by what I'll call fear-related characteristics, or safety-related characteristics. So if you get down at sort of marmot level, and you look around and you say, how far, um, you know, is there visibility greater than 50 meters from a particular borough area? Areas that had good visibility had higher probabilities of persistence. So we're talking local extinctions. Um, if there was a steep fall line, um, typically associated with greater visibility, um, that too was positively associated with population persistence. And importantly, if there were large rocks around, uh, that was associated with population persistence. Why large rocks? Because North American badgers come like a World War I tank and excavate the land and dig out badgers. So areas with rocks are safe for badger predation. We looked at grass cover um, and, and, and vegetation height, and we found no correlations associated, no significant correlations associated with, with those things and population persistence. So predation in risk influences population persistence. We know from a variety of studies, I spend an inordinate amount of time um, looking at any predator behavior, marmots um, have sophisticated abilities to communicate about predation risk um, that includes the ability to identify individuals, they can discriminate vocally individuals, um, to discriminate between reliable and unreliable individuals, so reliability of communication is likely an, an important factor that determines individuality of alarm calls. We know that they allocate time to anti-predator vigilance, which is a heritable trait. We know that they modify their vigilance based on visibility. We know that they recognize, or at least discriminate, the sight of and sound and smells of predators from non-predators, so they have sophisticated anti-predator recognition abilities. We know they dig burrows into which they escape, and after you walk towards an animal and it disappears into a burrow, you can wait around and time how long it takes to come back out. And doing some um, stochastic dynamic modeling, making a few assumptions, um, we see that these animals are hiding optimally. They're sensitive to the costs and benefits of hiding, and they will hide optimally. Um, and they adaptively vary their flight behavior. So while yesterday I was talking about interspecific differences in flight initiation distance, um, we know that there's a lot of adaptive variation within an individual as well. So in terms of infanticide risk, some species of marmots have tremendous infanticide risk. It seems to be um, reported, but it's very limited in the yellow-bellied marmots that I'm talking about today. Whereas the golden marmots I studied in Pakistan 22 to 26 percent of pup mortality was attributed to infanticide by strange males. That was more mortality from infanticide than was detected by predators. So infanticide in some systems can be really, really important. Alpine marmots infanticide is, 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 is present as well, but it's a little less common than golden marmots, but yellow-bellied marmots don't, don't seem to have much infanticide. Might be happening. So, um, between 2001 and two years ago, <laughs> um, we had a natural experiment. Now, if you look at the um, temperature, so the top graph is plotting, on the x-axis of all of these graphs is the year, on the y-axis we're looking at, on the top graph, the date of year, and the, the dotted lines are snow melt. So you can see that the snow is melting earlier, 
marmots are emerging earlier, that's the bottom line on the top graph, that the growing season is getting longer, and that the um, April temperature is getting higher as well. So the April temperature is getting um, warmer, the growing season is getting longer, marmots are emerging earlier, and the snow is melting sooner. What this means, and what this seems to be leading to, um, is there's a relationship between the average April temperature and the day of the year in which marmots emerge. In years where it's warmer in the spring, marmots are emerging earlier. And what we've seen between, particularly starting around 2000, 2001, oh, that doesn't show up that well. Um, too bad. Um, but th there's a top line that shows basically the population from 1962 goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And in the previous decade, it went up to over 300 individuals. Now, um, two years ago, it crashed. <laughs> um, and we sort of had the biggest population crash. But during this upswing in population, we um, had the, uh, a really good opportunity to um, look in detail at, at social relationships and a number of other things. And this is why and how I'm beginning to think about this sort of emergent view. So Robert Hind years ago talked about how um, you can have independent animals. Oh, sorry about this graph, it's a little light. Um, you can have independent animals, but they may aggregate. Now they may aggregate around ecological resources and begin to form um, aggregations. And once aggregated, there's the opportunity to have relationships between animals. And those relationships begin to define a social structure. What I want to talk a bit about today are some of these questions associated with structure. So we see variable group size. Remember, the modal group um, in the long run has been a single male and a single female. And we can ask questions about, well, is dominance important for these animals? What are the consequences of dominance? At some level, dominance itself is an emergent property in that we often calculate dominance by um, one animal approaches another, an animal inevitably moves away, and then we say that animal that moved away might be a loser. So you can probably always calculate dominance hierarchy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be meaningful in any way, shape, or form. So what we find is for males, but not for females, higher relative rank um, is associated with more annual reproductive success. So for males, rank has privileges. Higher ranking males have lead more offspring. Body condition, but not for females. Body condition, which is associated with rank, is relatively more important in explaining um, annual reproductive success um, in, in, in both males and females, but particularly um, males. That's a steeper curve. So one thing that um, struck us was that when you think about complex social behavior, sort of the epitome of complex, or one of the, the epitomes of complex social behavior are coalitions. Coalitions are complex um, uh, phenomena when animals cooperate and engage in cooperative behavior to accomplish something. They, they achieve better by um, collaborating. But if you think about coalitions. Um, coalitions, it, the, the concept of coalition depends on a series of traits. First, animals have to have some mutual tolerance. They have to be able to share their space. Second, they might have to collaborate. They might have to work together to obtain a common goal. And third, um, they might have partner preferences. They might prefer to collaborate with some individuals versus another. And those are the sort of what I'll call attributes of coalitionary behavior. And you can have one, two, or none of these, or all three, or, or none of these. Um, and, and depending upon the um, degree of uh, coalitionary complexity, I think this is a way, Creature Olson and I think this is a way, um, to begin thinking about, instead of saying coalitionary behavior is an all or none phenomena, to think about gradation in coalitionary behavior. So Lucretia, a former grad student of mine, and I did a comparative study where we looked at mammals and we looked for um, evidence of uh, what factors drove complexity in our coalition, these coalitionary traits. And interspecifically in mammals, we found that estrous duration, um, when estrus was longer, um, 
there were there was there were more complex coalitions evolved. When group sizes were bigger, more complex coalitions evolved. And when animals had dominance hierarchies, more complex coalitions evolved. So you can imagine that these are three variables that explain interspecific variation in coalitional <coughs> complexity. Habitat type, activity period, and food distribution were things that you know might influence it. Uh, people have suggested these things might be important in coalitions. Um, in our analysis with the species we looked at, um, we didn't find any support for that. So then, with this sort of as a background idea, we wanted to apply it to yellow bellied marmots and say, are marmots sufficiently flexible to form coalitions when possible? So we found that, um, particularly during the time we were working, we had groups um, that contained one to seven males. Um, but we found that males don't necessarily monopolize reproduction. You see a little bit of everything. Sometimes one male can monopolize all reproduction. We were developed a series of microsatellites we could use to assign paternity. And we found that in some cases, males shared reproduction. Um, and they could share it one of two ways. They could share it by either one male monopolized some females and another male monopolized other females. Or they could share reproduction by um, all having sex with the same females and having mixed litters. And we found everything. Um, marmots are not a good model system for human behavior. Um, you know, they, 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 they do other things as well. They inbreed as well. Um, males like to mate with their daughters if they can. Um, not a good model for human behavior. Anyway, so they're, they're pretty wild though. Males don't seem to discriminate um, between group members. There's no obvious partner preference. Um, and then we, we scared them. Um, we got a stuffed badger that I have, Robo Badger, and we put the badger out. Um, and we wanted to see that in groups with multiple males, maybe they would share the risks. Maybe they would um, share the opportunity to call and warn others. Now remember, badgers are terrified marmots. They really don't like badgers. Badgers really will kill a whole family group if they can dig into a burrow. And badgers only occasionally come through our study population, but when they come through our study population, they leave soil everywhere and dead marmots everywhere. I mean, they're really efficient predators. In any event, we put the, this, this model badger out, and uh, um, you know, first it looked as though any, the first, and we were targeting the male particularly, we would cover it up and then the male would walk by, we uncover it. And, you know, pretty much every time it's like the male looks at the badger and runs away quietly. And we said, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, it's sort of hard to know whether it saw it, so let's, let's, let's uncover it and play just one alarm call. Then the male would look at the badger for sure. I mean, we knew it would look at the badger and run away quietly. So there was no obvious collaboration. They weren't trying to take turns, giving alarm calls. I mean, they, they really don't like each other. Um, males don't enhance reproduction by being in multi-male groups. If anything, they um, do worse. And multi-male groups seem to form in some areas when the population increases. So you have this population increase. You have this demographic variation. And then you sort of may have multi-male groups emerging over time. So what I would conclude from this that much like European badgers, um, male yellow-bellied marmots are social, but they're not cooperative, even when they could be. So cooperation is something that requires more than simple demographics, but even in a very socially plastic, um, facultatively social species, just because you have animals hanging out together doesn't mean cooperation will emerge. So I've been a proponent and a skeptic and a critic and an enthusiast of social network statistics. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a proponent because um, I think that they offer tools to precisely quantify what I'm going to call attributes of relationships. I'm a skeptic because if it's not useful, why you use them? Um, and I'm a critic because um, in many cases, people are using them without really thinking about what they mean. And I'm just going to say it's really hard to think about what these things really mean. However, they are a toolbox of tools that can be used to define specific attributes of sociality. What I really like about them is you can define um, both direct and indirect relationships. And all of this comes from calculations of association matrices, observations of individuals either hanging out together or interacting with each other socially in some way. 
If you're looking at social interactions, you can look at affiliative interactions, animals doing something nice to each other, agonistic interactions, animals wanting at each other. You can have these association matrices be calculated in a directional way. Um, I like to hit others, I get hit by others. Um, you can weight them based on the number or proportion of different sorts of interactions in a group, or you can do them in a binary way. Now, I will say that the Google people have made a lot of money using binary networks. So um, while some social network people say, oh, everything should be weighted, um, that's an empirical question. So in many cases, when we do these analyses, um, because we've been beaten down by reviewers, we sort of analyze it every possible way, um, which has its own set of problems, but um, we can talk about those later. So if, such, if social network statistics are going to be useful to explain something important, um, maybe these should be traits. And if these are traits, maybe they should be heritable. So we ask the question, because heritable social traits may evolve. So we have a marmot genealogy. And for the first um, 40 years, it was based on observations. It didn't necessarily have paternity sorted out, but it had maternity. And in many cases, it had paternity if there's only one male around. Um, there's only one male that's likely to be the father. If there's multiple males around, there's a little less certainty. And then for the last decade or so, we, we, we have a, 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 a molecular genealogy. So um, we decompose sources of variation into additive genetic variation, social group variation, permanent environment variation. And we can begin to ask, is there additive genetic variation for these network traits? And what we found, interestingly, is that um, for the traits we look at for this analysis, network position can be heritable. It doesn't have to be, but we can detect heritable variation in some traits. And what we um, looked at here, and what was very interesting, is that um, you can look at affiliative or agonistic traits. And, um, and an in-degree is out degree is something you're doing to another individual. So this is being nice to another individual. This is out degree. This is in degree. This is um, other individuals being nice to you. And it turns out that attractiveness and in degree for agonistic traits had significant additive genetic variance. We refer to this as heritable victimization. <laughs> so basically, there's a heritable, there's heritable variation in the propensity to, be, to tolerate being beaten up by others. Now, these are rarely high-level fights. Mostly these are simple displacements, the occasional SWAT. You don't see a lot of high-level fights in functioning social groups. But what's interesting is, and I think it makes sense if you think about it, um, only one animal is going to be dominant. But if you're going to be plastic enough to live in a social group, you have to tolerate some degree of aggression. And what we found is tolerating some degree of aggression is a heritable trait, which kind of interested us. So there are a couple of other um, important things to think about network position. They can be constrained by other traits, and that heritability may be present only in certain ontogenetic stages, which once you start thinking about quantitative genetics, all bets are off. Um, so you're, you're thinking about what are the sources of variation, and um, you know it can be in one environment and not another environment. You could be at a certain time of life, etc. So let me show you two results that, that, that bear on these caveats. So we looked at network position, um, and uh, uh, we looked at two forms of aggression, what I'll call defensive aggression and, and, and sort of um, uh, uh, social aggression. Defensive aggression is when we trap the marmots, um, we live trap them, we don't knock them out, they walk into a cage, and sometimes they rattle the cage and try to bite us through the cage. Um, these, we call these animals defensively aggressive. Turns out this is a repeatable trait. It's a personality trait. That within individual variation, animals behave consistently in how they uh, respond when trapped. Social aggression is animals calculated from the social network, animals going out and you know, swatting other animals occasionally or going towards another animal. We use the social network statistics, expansiveness, and aggressive degree to define these interactions. That too was repeatable, meaning that individuals can behave in consistent, predictable ways. There's personality <laughs> in these social network statistics as well. But they're not correlated together. 
they were correlated, we would have a syndrome, an aggressive syndrome. And syndromes are fine. I mean, they may be there. But if there's a syndrome, a detectable um, syndrome, then they're not assorting independently. Then they're not able to evolve independently. So in some cases, there may be syndromes of, of these traits. In other cases, there may not be. The other thing is, and this, this is coming up next week, um, that heritability may emerge over time. This is looking at another example, alarm call structures. We measure a bunch of parameters about what makes individuals sound different. And that in juveniles, we found no significant additive genetic variants for what baby marmots sound like. We found a lot of maternal effects, which is interesting and suggests a testable hypothesis about the cause of that, which is that the maternal stress environment, how scared the mother is, She's scared she's going to have high glucocorticoid levels. She's scared has high glucocorticoid levels. She's putting those into her milk. Previous studies we've done show that glucocorticoid levels influence the structure of vocalizations. This may account for these strong maternal effects. Nonetheless, by the time animals became a little older, they sort of matured into their true voice. We could detect significant heritability. If things like this are happening in social network statistics as well, that we might be looking at. Maybe um, heritability is constrained temporarily. Okay, so we started getting into a series of um, analyses looking at the development, the ontogeny of social relationships. Um, this is work with Tina Wei, um, a former graduate student um, who's done a lot of the social network statistic work in, with us. Um, and we, we, we looked at what we might call direct interactions, um, expansiveness, and this is sort of the tendency to initiate interactions with other individuals. Attractiveness, um, the tendency for animals to interact with you directly. But once you have a network, it's not simply um, what you do or what others do to you. It's what you do to someone that's connected to others. So the easiest way to think about this is a sexual disease transmission network. Um, you know, whether or not um, who you're sleeping with, um, the, the likelihood that you get a disease isn't simply a function of who you're sleeping with, but also who they've slept with. And you can have super spreaders that have you know, an inordinate impact on um, disease spread, for example. But anyway, there are a number of metrics that not only capture um, direct interactions, but, calculate, but, but capture sort of um, that the, the how an individual is related to directly and indirectly to that whole population. So out closeness is the ability to reach others through short path lengths, and in closeness is the ability to be reached by others. So what we initially found was that age and kinship influence affiliation preference. So um, we could um, sort of infer or describe marmots who were friendlier to others um, in the same age class and um, that were related. And that's good, because that sort of, this, this sort of uh, replicates Ken Armitage's results that he um, inferred from very, very different sorts of data. But we also know that there's, um, that, that animals of the same age are more likely to interact than animals of other ages. Um, less consistent rules about who fight. It was a less, the magnitude of the effect size was smaller, it was still positive. Kinship influences aggression as well. Age and sex influence social tendencies. So older and male marmots are crankier. Um, what do I mean by that? That they're more likely, um, as they get older, to you know, tr go out and try to beat up others. Um, and, and there's a strong effect of, of sex on being you know, aggressive. Um, females received more affiliation from more partners, and males initiated more um, uh, aggression other partners. So there's sex-specific importance of social relationships. We, we want to differ in the nature of their social relationships. These social relationships should be more, uh, relatively more important for females than for males. And this sort of gave us an opportunity to um, test a long-standing question in animal behavior, Mark Beckwell's hypothesis about social cohesion influencing dispersal. So this, uh, the idea here is that Individuals that are more connected with others, that are more cohesive with others, are going to be um, less likely to disperse. So, as I said before, pretty much all males disperse, although not necessarily over the last decade. 
but um, on average about half the females disperse as yearlings. So we see variation, and maybe we can understand this variation and test this social um, cohesion hypothesis. There are a lot of measures of centrality, and I find it really useful to go to social network experts and try to struggle with them to explain the problems I'm having and you know what's the best metric for something. So people just calculate stuff because they can. That doesn't mean they should. And we were looking initially at another measure of centrality, and this colleague said, oh, no, 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 you should look at embeddedness. Embeddedness is the idea um, that it asks the question, how cohesive is your subgroup? So if these are each an, an if each of these are an individual, and these are the relationships <coughs> between them, all of these nodes, all of these individuals, have the same degree. Each of them interact with the same number of others. Yet, um, this individual is highly central, but it has low embeddedness. It's not really embedded um, the same way that these individuals are embedded in uh, a network of relationships with others. So, what we found was that females with a tighter group of friends, if you will, um, were more likely to stay at home. Dispersal was, it was influenced by affiliative embeddedness. Embeddedness did not influence male dispersal. We could calculate variation in male embeddedness, but it didn't influence um, the likelihood that they would disperse or not. We can also ask, and I think it's important to ask before we conclude that social network statistics are useful, is we want to know whether um, there are fitness consequences to these things. So if there are fitness consequences to these traits, um, then maybe we should begin to pay attention to certain sorts of traits. So sociality, as I've been saying, has many attributes. And these attributes may differentially influence reproductive success. So we use, and many of these are correlated, so you can calculate a whole bunch of these things and, and a lot of them are correlated. So we use um, factor analysis to reduce this set of correlated social network measures to a series of um, four big traits. The first one um, we call connectivity. This was determined by the degree, who you're in, or number of individuals you're interacting with, out degree, in degree. If you're interacting with more, you're likely to interact out with more and be interacted with by more. Um, closeness and embeddedness. We talked. Of, we defined a second factor as affiliation spread. This was using weighted measures of degree, in degree and out degree. Victimization um, sort of dropped out as um, individuals who mostly received aggressive interactions by others. And bullying um, dropped out as those individuals who sort of, you know, give aggressive interaction to others. What we found is that social variation uh, measured this way may actually have fitness consequences. Um, interestingly, and perversely, and interestingly, um, females with stronger social bonds did not have higher reproductive success. If anything, they had lower reproductive success. The animals are social, but they're not cooperative. If social groups form in good times, um, over good periods of time when there's sufficient food and animals don't all die, in areas that are sufficiently large, but simply because they form social groups doesn't mean they like being around each other. We can actually find costs of um, uh, uh, these, these bonds. Friendlier females, those with stronger affiliation strength, actually had reduced reproductive success. There's a cost to having these affiliated relationships. Um, and this may be a consequence of these greater group sizes in the last decade, we don't know. Being a bully, being more aggressive, enhanced the male reproductive success, which is consistent with our understanding of dominance relationships. Um, and um, a number of other social factors um, don't influence ectoparasites or endoparasite infections. So I mean, a major cost of sociality is disease, and we've spent too much time and, and a lot of frustrating time trying to study diseases in these guys. Um, males have more parasites than females. There's a tendency for animals with higher affiliation strength to have fewer fleas, but it's, it's not that great. So there might be a slight benefit of affiliative um, relationships. And what I mean by that is that Individuals that have affiliated relationships are likely to aloe groom, and there's maybe a, a way that they can reduce the, the cost of ectoparasites. So all of this, really, thinking about these, I'm doing stuff with communication, and I'm thinking um, that all of these are attributes, and that, that maybe we need to think about sociality um, 
in, in a very attribute-based way. So I think the, the value, as I said, of social network statistics and the social network approach is that um, you're very precise in how you're defining each of these types of relationships, each of these attributes of sociality. By analogy, um, I and others have done a number of studies looking at communicative complexity. It makes a lot of sense that species that are more social um, have more complex communication, either because sociality drives complex communication or because complex communication emerges from being more social. But what do we mean by complex communication and what do we mean by sociality? And you have to ask the question. You have to be clear on that you're asking a question. So um, Kim Pollard and I um, reviewed some of our work and some other work and um, found, and, and, and some of the take home messages are that if you look at ground squirrels, marmots and prairie dogs and, and, and ground squirrels, um, group size drives the, drives the evolution of vocal individuality. There's an evolutionary relationship between the number of individuals that you live with and how individualistic your um, alarm calls are, which makes sense. Um, if, the, if, if, the, if reliability assessment is, a, is an important factor in individuality, which I think it is. However, um, demographic role variability, I developed a, Ken Armitage and I, a number of years ago, developed a, a, a one number to, to, to look at social complexity, and it was an information-based um, statistic that really emphasizes <laughs> the number and types and variation in demographic roles. So in some of these ground squirrels, everyone disperses after the first year of life. In other species, you have multi-generational families living together. So you can look at variation in the number and types of aged individuals and come up with a, using information theory, come up with a statistic that really is demographic role complexity. Demographic role complexity seems to be associated with repertoire size, the number of things you say. In other systems, primates, Mating systems drive the evolution of complex repertoires and syntax. So I think that, um, that certainly in how people are thinking, I mean, a lot of people have thought about social evolution, study primates, um, and, and these attribute-based approaches isn't the typical way people are thinking about primate social variability. But I think what's interesting is that um, when one does take an attribute-based approach, I think it really opens the door towards taking a very Tinbergian approach to thinking about um, sociality. You can ask questions at all levels, as um, many of which I've, I've, I've referred to today. You can look at the development of these relationships and what influences the development. You can look at the consequences of these relationships. You can look at the evolution of these relationships. And in some cases, you can look at the proximate causation of these relationships. So to wrap up, um, I think uh, take home messages are, I think ecological constraints and demographic chance may force animals to live socially and this can modulate group size. That social interactions in a, in a very Heinean sense emerge from the opportunity to be social. That, that social network statistics um, really allow us to quantify precise social attributes. Many of these may be correlated, maybe these can be reduced to um, larger factors um, or not depending upon what you're interested in doing, that some of these social attributes have consequences. In other words, they are useful um, to understand why we see differences in fitness among individuals. The consequences of sociality may be sex-specific, as we saw in dispersal. And that I think an emergent view, as I just said, um, fits nicely into, into a Tinbergian framework that, and they structure novel questions about the causes and consequences of social variation. So once again, Gato, thank you for listening to me. I apologize for knowing no Portuguese. And I've had a great time. I'm looking for more fun conversations today based on this and other things today. So thank you so much for having me. I have uh, I have a couple of questions. The first, I would like to, uh, when you, you you said that there are great differences between male and females, and you started to look for cooperation in this uh, 
badgers, one of the badgers. Uh, my question is, uh, these animals are not linear, you say, they, they have much more affiliative relationships between females. So have you investigated if females cooperate when there is some uh, badger coming or there are, uh, it, it could be more, make more sense? So, very, very good question. We're focusing on males here. Um, I haven't done the same experiments with females, but what's interesting when you look at different species of ground squirrels and prairie dogs and marmots um, is that some of these species really seem to have contagious calling. That when a predator comes through, everyone starts calling. And what's interesting about that is that the pattern of alarm calling can be used to infer something about the function or targets of those alarm calls. So alarm calls could be directed to con specifics. It could, they could be used to warn relatives. They could be used to create pandemonium. Everyone starts running around, and then you can escape. Um, they don't have to be nice things. Or they could be directed to the predator to scare the predator away. I've seen you. You're never going to get me. Go away. Um, in in yellow-bellied marmots, we do not see contagious calling. Prairie dog towns start putting a dog into a prairie dog town or walking a dog through a prairie dog town. Everyone starts calling. Some species of ground squirrels as well. A lot of individuals call. It's not uncommon to only have one individual calling when a predator is going through, even a big colony. Um, so there doesn't seem the opportunity for that. In a previous study with females, um, we asked the question, um, is there, in, in, a, in a Paul Sherman-esque way, is there any evidence of relationships and the sort of amount of potential you know, inclusive fitness around you um, to influence this, uh, the frequency with which animals call. So animals find themselves in different size groups with different numbers of kin around, and if kin selection was important, um, kin selection sensu stricto was important, then individuals surrounded by more kin um, with more potential inclusive fitness benefits should be more likely to call, assuming calling is risky. Now that's an assumption. I don't think calling is that risky, nonetheless. Um, the only thing we've concluded from this is that everyone calls at low frequencies early in the season, and then after the pups emerge, which are quite vulnerable, only the mothers increase their calling, and pretty much everyone else decreases their calling, suggesting that alarm calling isn't a kin-selected behavior sensu stricto. Sensu lato, I mean, taking care of your kids is kin-selected, but that's not really that interesting. And that's, you know, maternal care is easy to think about. Um, doing some complex Hamiltonian calculus or arithmetic is a little harder to think about. So I don't think, to answer your question in a long-winded way, I don't think there's cooperation among females, too. It would be a good experiment to do, It'd be easy to do. Well, not easy, but it would, it would be good to do. Thank you. Just another quick one. I don't think I understood very well the heritability of voice. But uh, as I, I understood it, there is more variability when they're young and less variability when they're old, is that? No, no, it's just the, the different things explain that variability. So um, variability when animals are young seems to be explained by the, I don't remember the exact coefficients of variation for the traits, I should look that one up. But the important thing is when you try to decompose those sources of variation, <coughs> we found significant maternal environmental effects on that variation. After controlling for the social group and the year and the you know, dates and a whole bunch of other things. But when they became older, their true voice sort of appeared. Um, the heritable, the additive genetic components of that variation suddenly popped up as being significant, pretty systematically, which is kind of interesting to us. Does this have any correlation with the dialect in birds, which also have variability in a phase of the development, and then they converge so, to a dial add-on dialect? So, so what's really interesting about mammal vocalizations compared to bird vocalizations, and, and this is why organizations like the National Institute of Health have put so much money into bird song learning studies, um, is that birds that learn their songs are a really good model for human language development and dysfunction because most mammals don't learn their vocalizations. Most mammals' vocalizations may change because of ontogenetic structural changes, but not because of experience. Exceptions to that are bats and some marine mammals, um, but not primates, interestingly. 
So it doesn't seem to be, um, it might be development. The baby marmots sound different than bigger than uh, older marmots, um, in part because of their body size, in that um, they're smaller and they have higher pitch sounds. But when you look at sources of variation within an age class, there seem to be different components driving it. I have a comment myself. Well, I see no problem with the use of the concept of emergence there, so... You have no problem. Yeah, yeah, there would be much more to expand on that, but I don't see any problematic use of the concept. I don't know if Mark at least. Uh, if you say something. But one thing that I was thinking, the model that Novak, uh, Tardit, and Wilson proposed in that very controversial paper of 2010, is a kind of similar to the Hind model. And they, they tell that the groups, uh, animals uh, form groups for other reasons, uh, several different reasons can, uh, can aggregate. Animals then have an individual selection that leads them to the emergence of traits that come only from the interaction of the groups, and then group selection enters. Uh, so I'm curious uh, to know what I think about these affiliative and agonistic behaviors in groups, uh, the, the emergent group traits could lead to any kind of group selection in these animals depend on the variability because I think the key point is to group selection to work, groups should be much more variable between themselves than the variation within the group. Yeah, you know, um, those are questions we're going to ask and they're on the, they're on the list of things we want to look at. Um, I think the beauty of social network statistics is you're finding groups in ways that um, very, are very amenable to looking at the consequences of having particular forms of structure. So every year our groups the old, the old females are there, the males may be there, but there's a whole suite of other individuals, and structure, we have structural variation between years. So we haven't yet looked at the consequences of that for either individual reproductive success in groups, group reproductive success, likelihood that the group's going to be there the next year, etc. But we're working towards that, and I think that social network statistics give you the tools to look at group selected. Um, Phenomena very precisely. Yeah, just a short comment. This could this could seems to be a fantastic model to do this kind of study of group selection. So um, just to follow up on uh, uh, as to follow up on Charles comment uh, on on the way the use of emergence. So for, emergence for you is just an additive property of the group, or is it sort of the sum uh, being, I mean the whole being more than the sum of the parts? I mean, this is the kind of thing we were, uh, I think Donato is going to talk about more this afternoon, but I think philosophers maybe have a more um, particular meaning of emergence beyond sort of aggregation. You know, the, the, the description of what's happening at the population level is just some kind of aggregate of individual behaviors. I think I've been using it in a more simplistic term now, but I think that um, certainly you can't have interactions and relationships until you have individuals together. But then, um, as Sharma was implying, that, that you, know, this, you can then look at um, differences amongst groups of different structures and have the tools to look at that. So I think, at some level, I'm thinking about it both ways, but at a very simplistic level, kind of simplistic in my thinking, um, that it's, it's initially it's that you can have individuals hanging out. You can only have that when you have demographic opportunity. Um, and you needn't necessarily have more complex collaborative processes come out from that. I shall say that what I got from uh, Dan's talk is that uh, these social group traits are the result of non additive relationships of the components causes. That that's what I got. Maybe I got wrong. Not just aggregation, not just summation. Because this summation then is not really emergent, it should be non additive. And most groups probably have a mix of additive and non additive. How, 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 what would I look at precisely to quantify additive and non additive? What, uh, what, yeah, well, what you should look is if the causes are modulating each other. How, how, how would I do that? Or or methodologically. Let's talk about it. Yeah, one, uh, you should, you should, that's, that's a complicated question. But uh, uh, you, you cannot decompose the variability into just uh, uh, additive components. Or if you, if you decompose the variability into additive components and have something that's lacking, 
Yeah. That would be a clue that has uh, some modulation being caught between the two causes. Other ways you could make a risk model and try to understand what causes modulated, which other causes, each uh, and, and other causes, and then you see that the the product the product of that of the group is a kind of composite of the joint operation of the causes. It's not that the causes give a, a separate contribution to the effect. But I like one metaphor by the Richard Levantin that shows this quite clearly. Uh, if you have additive relationships, uh, it's like uh, if you have two, two, what is the name in English for these people who build walls? They are two construction workers. <laughs> they are doing the work of, they are doing a wall for you, and each of them work with the bricks and put separate bricks there. Then you can calculate how much of the wall each of them made. And so this is just a additive relationship. But if you want, uh, puts a uh, mortar in the bricks and the other puts the bricks <coughs> and then you cannot calculate. Uh, 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 they are not actively building the, the, the wall, they are non actively building the wall. So, so looking at this interspecific variation and complexity, I'm wondering why complexity is over to the right. Anyway, um, looking at this the coalitionary traits idea, so this is trying to explain variation in the number of these coalitionary traits present. Um, you know, there's a significant effect of group size, but there's other things also that influence that. So, how would that, how would one think about, you know, a, a quantitative analysis that would begin to tease apart um, additive and non-additive effects? What would I look for in an analysis? Maybe we can I, I cannot answer this now. We have to think about yeah, yeah. how to do that. That, 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 would be, that, would, complicated. that would be really fun to do. That's really good. That's really fantastic. Um, my skills points. Yeah, we have three minutes. Yeah. Just. Actually, don't have a notion if what I will say is something that is important to this, but. Looking for interaction among among factors could be the looking for this emergent property. Looking among fa uh, interaction among factors is this uh, know how to do it, even if you have uh, continuous variables. I don't know. You have the partial. Uh, is that? Because yeah, because as I understood. The, the result is not only the result of the single uh, uh, influence of one and other factor, but it's a result that is uh, linked to the interaction between factors that make something else. Then you can put the interaction factor in the analysis and, and see if the interaction factor, interaction... Uh, so emergent sociality would then be described or demonstrated when group size interacting with something else yeah. leads to something particular. Not simply group size, that would imply an additive, yeah. a straight effect of group size. It leads to something irreducible to the effect of each variable separate. So, I mean, we certainly have that for some of these traits. Because uh, yeah. our models are quite complex. And yeah. In some cases, interactions pop out as, as being the best models. There is one funny thing about emergence. Emergence has a lot of literature on and turned into a kind of mystical word that has much more meaning than it should have. Emergence, in fact, is quite simple. I think emergence is just that that we are discussing. But then people start thinking about consciousness and start saying, incredible burden of meaning on this word, and the word cannot handle that, cannot really bear that burden. So I think emergence is quite simple. It's just something like that, that we cannot reduce something at the level of the whole to the level of the component. Parts. But I would say that we need to have a statistical approach to work with direction, but we should go for a mechanistic model to understand how these things are really inter interact. And I think this would be the next step so that we understand better why it is emerging. Last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. E à tarde retornamos às duas.